What I'm going to try to do today is give you a different way to view the world, specifically a different way to view the world economy and the future that you face from a business, economic, and political sense. Each of our lenses is biased. We see the world in a distorted way. And what we need to do is combine these distortions to try to develop a new form of focus. Many of us are blinded by focus. We're missing the opportunities as well as sort of lurking risks hidden in plain sight. I want you to focus on the emergence of this forthcoming consumption boom. A billion middle class people spending money that they previously didn't have. You do not have to be an expert. You don't need to have a PhD. You just need to take a step back and observe what's happening around you. Do it mindfully and you will identify opportunities that others may miss. If we had gone to an energy conference 10 years ago, and over there in the corner of the room, these fringy engineers saying, oh my God, what if you put all this fluid and push it in at high pressure and you get, you unlock all this stranded gas and energy. And you were talking about fracking. They've been talking about it for years. But the middle of the room wasn't paying attention. The middle of the room was paying attention to the conventional logic. They were on the side. They've now moved to the middle of the room. So my question is, who's on the side? Who's the guy that we should pay attention to that we're not? How we choose to understand, interpret, and navigate through the developments that are being constantly thrown at us is our choice. We can adopt a threat-oriented perspective, or we can adopt an opportunity-oriented perspective. China underwent an investment bubble, which has burst. They overbuilt. They built too much. And as a result, they are now going to build less. The result, of course, is that their consumption of commodities, as everyone in this room again likely knows, has fallen. But let me just reflect for one moment on how significant a player in the commodity markets China was. Between the years 2005 and 2015, China consumed more concrete than the United States, Mexico, and Canada, i.e. North America, did between 1900 and 2000. Let's take a look at what's happened to the currencies of several commodity countries. Anyone who watches currency markets, to talk about 10% move is a big move, a 20% move is big, 30, 40, 50% moves. This is very disruptive. As a global equities investor, I visited more than 60 countries. I made a point when in each country to meet with not just the business leaders, but also government leaders, regulators, academics, journalists, and ordinary people on the street. Crossing these silos helped me identify opportunities as well as navigate through these risks. Let us not confuse GDP and GDP per capita because we have a race underway. There's a race between the growth of an economy and the population of that economy. It is unclear who is winning that race. The part I love about speaking the most is seeing that aha moment in the audience. When they connect the dots, when they learn there's a different way to think about problems. Morocco has 75% of the proven phosphate rock reserves on this planet. And that means in the land of food, well, definitely fertilizers, and likely food, Morocco will have more power than OPEC or Saudi Arabia ever had in the land of oil and energy. While I talk about lots of different topics, they all are customized to a particular industry, a particular client, and the particular needs or wants or topical concerns of that audience. Some of the things I talk about are, for instance, the end of cheap food. I was talking about protein demand, and then I went to food prices. Surely there's food that's not protein. It's not animal protein, right? No, there isn't. Not in my eyes. Why is that? because the chicken had to eat. And the chicken had non-protein in its feed. Pound of chicken, two pounds of grain. Roughly went into the chicken. Between three and four pounds of grain go into a pig to produce one pound of pork. And now what happens if the world starts consuming beef? 
God help us, because there'll be so much demand for grains, we won't be able to keep up with it. Because each pound of beef, the cow consumed eight pounds of grain. Another topic I speak about is spotting financial bubbles before they burst. I pay attention to something like art markets. It does a wonderful job of telegraphing bubbles and major global economic slowdowns. This is a chart that looks like a bubble indicator, right? It's the first peaked in 1990, the Japan bubble burst, and then it comes back down. Then it peaks in 99, the tech bubble burst, and then the stock comes down. Then it goes up in 07, it burst, it comes back down. It goes up again in 11 and 13, and now it's on its way down. So what is this chart? This is a data point that all of you can pull up literally on a smartphone or a computer. This is the stock chart for Sotheby's, this auction house that sells art. In all of these prior peaks, right before and even as the stock price was coming down, we had people from the bubbly sort of country buying art at world record prices because it's the height of hubris. One of the more popular topics that I discuss is the generalist advantage. And so if you think about your own futures and what's happening with your businesses, think about different scenarios. Look at different dots, meaning see who's generating wealth how, see who's behaving how and why. Read things like People Magazine. Look at newsstands when you're walking through airports and train stations, etc., to see what's selling. Pay attention to TV shows. Pay attention to what's happening in front of you. Open your eyes. And I think if you connect these dots, you'll get incremental insights. The forthcoming global consumption boom, another topic I speak a fair amount about, has to do with the emergence of a middle class that is going to consume everything from more food to more energy, more healthcare, more smartphone purchases. In 1980, three out of four consumers of goods in the world were based here in the developed world. Within the next 10 years, three out of four consumers in the world of goods and services will be based in the developing world. Rising inequality actually may be the fundamental cause behind a lot of the unrest we're feeling in the world today. People are feeling squeezed. This world in which countries are now starting to say, I don't care about the global pie, I care about my slice, is going to be a difficult world to navigate. I actually think Brexit was the beginning of a long set of dominoes that are gonna fall. Within 10 years, we will have one of two outcomes, I'm pretty convinced. One outcome is we get the United States of Europe, or I think you end up in a totally different world, which is individual states with individual currencies. And it's a slow, painful process, but I think you end up going in that direction. My bet is in 10 years, we're gonna end up on this side, not on this side. It is my belief that globalization, while in retreat today, will return. Uh, and it will help the economic environment, but it unfortunately won't solve all of our problems because technology marches forward. And with that comes all sorts of risks and opportunities. Be opportunity thinking oriented. And that's to see the world through the noise at what is a really amazing positive future. A potentially re-globalizing world. A potential world where billions enter the middle class and consume everything from meat through smartphones. And that is a world that creates a host of opportunities. Ones that you can capture if you plan and navigate accordingly.